some uh, incoherent thoughts on the occasion of the recent election. Um, a structural approach or long durée approach, which is to say, not at the scale of event or something that um, changes institutions as they are, such as the French Revolution, or at the scale of generation, such as which is abundantly obvious in our time, as it's spoken of all the time, uh, generation X, generation Y, etc. Um, but something meant to last longer than that seems to be the appropriate way of approaching this issue um, in our time. But it said each ep epic should attempt to envisage or to dream uh, the future. Um, so the future would be the time when structural analysis was no longer important. But for now, since we live in this time, um, and since uh, the pregnant possibilities of uh, Heideggerian thinking have only been exploited to the extent that Dugan has exploited them, but I think To some extent, he's only exploited them for the reason of um, the Ruski Mir, for the Russian world, but not for all humanity. On the other hand, I should say, by what he says himself, that's vexed because he does, he, he's written all these hundreds of books about various places countries, peoples, and, but at the other hand, how can he say anything but, um, he thinks Ru the orthodox uh, Russian way of life should be somehow universalized. That's a very complex, I mean, the, the Catholics said about the same thing. Catholics have the reputation of, I mean, the word Catholic means universal and so on and so on, but many Catholics uh, find this absurd, and when you look at Catholic history, you look at Catholics in China and so on, you see that there's always the attitude of preserving the, um, what we now call culture, which is an indefinite sentence, something thematized only in recent centuries, and um, basically coinciding with Dugan's feeling uh, field, ethnology, or anthropology, as we call it, with the move from psychology to anthropology, where anthropology then becomes the study of the most comprehensive um, a t uh, um, account of any group, which is to say not uh, politics as against private life or public as against private life. But everything all-inclusive is what um, anthropology is supposed to include. And then um, okay, let's reset a little bit. In, in this election, what happened then according to a structural analysis? It seems to me, one, we should start with the concept of Davos entity, um, which doesn't mean literally that Klaus Schwab or whatever his name is um, runs things, but just that um, this is where people who meet, who uh, are trying to guide the, um, the what's it, what uh, Wallerstein called world system, and that this seems to be the appropriate scope of analysis for the American election. It seems obvious when we think that um, of course, after the election, Dugan said, oh, all the Russians side uh, relief because they think that Trump will be better able to settle the Ukraine situation than um, 
Harris or a Democratic uh, Party official would because um, the Democratic Party seems to be, I'll say it this way, Davos Entity plus <clears throat> a disc, uh, plus the woke discount. So plus this, con this distraction of the um, cultural uh, wars. Um, <clears throat> then the Republican Party seems to, it makes one think of Third Empire furniture and their remark about uh, first as tragedy, then as comedy, the Jijik's remarks about the obscene masters, etc., etc., at the same time of LARPing, of um, Berlusconi, um, etc., etc. But um, what does it mean from the point of I would say it's Davos plus um, um, some other. Um, aggrandizing discount. Um, I would fall back uh, on, on something like the... Um, there's some sense to this, it, it, saying Davos was a Thatcher type of discount. Um, because the Thatcher was saying, oh, let's um, bring back the things that are genuinely British and Let's take back the Falklands. So we're not going to let the, um, anything genuinely British go because there's this sense of the um, falling apart of empire, and then maybe Brit Britain isn't, maybe it's not so great anymore. Um, but what I want to say mainly, that's my main starting point, is that both both parties, Democrat and Republican, are. Um, essentially uh, in, from this they're essentially world system parties which have the same same aim basically so what's the aim basically is here I want to sort of distinguish between Wallerstein and Zizek view and a more I think the Zizek view makes more sense the Wallerstein view is every um, the Wallerstein view is this view which I think is caught in this sort of heavy gravity of um, wanting something to be true, um, of the collapse of the um, of the global system. Um, and his analysis says, okay, because um, basically how capitalism works is it opens, it creates markets by gu by gun gunboat diplomacy. It opens up. Uh, markets it creates today we have these 700 800 american bases all over the world it opens up markets it says and it doesn't it's actually not the markets that are opened up it's the um, places where you can get cheap labor are opened up so the most recent version is the um, or the most recent version of great importance for the present day is um, uh, the Jing Jinping's um, special um, economic zones. So it's like come in companies, and oh, the great example of that is um, in the current period, in the contemporary period, is um, Apple, who operates in like not just China, but in I think like seven countries, maybe half a dozen or more, more, more than half a dozen countries around the South China Sea. But what, because obviously, because the labor's cheaper there, um, minimum wage, uh, fight for minimum wage is less there. Um, uh, workers' rights are less. Workers are just less expensive in general, health care, et cetera, et cetera. It's cheaper, cheaper labor. So that's all, that's the whole motive uh, from the Wallerstein point of view. That's the simplest way to understand capitalism, capitalism through military constructs places where Australia is a good example um, and Marx has already used the example of Australia they construct places where you can make people uh, who used to be peasants or who used to be doing something else into um, uh, factory workers or into cheap labor but the point of Wallerstein is that this this way of doing things which de facto affects the globe because, of course, Apple is a good example as a global company. They've exhausted the possibility of um, 
harvesting cheap labor pretty much and they've created too many um, sort of bourgeois so the point of capitalism is um, the point of totalitarianism is basically the bourgeois say it's like a building the bourgeois say here let's have a private security force and it's totally locked down so that's the point of that's the that's the whole point that's that's the simple way to understand uh, the the view of um, uh, Wallerstein, um, uh, and uh, Marxism to some extent. Uh, but then his view is that once the country is run simply like a building that has a security force, and then therefore for the owners of the building, which are uh, uh, the public false I would say false view is that it's 1%, but the Wallerstein view, which is probably more accurate, is it's more like you have 20% of people doing 40% or more of the expenditure, um, which means everybody else um, does much less spending or does takes much less from what's collectively produced from the world. And then... The more this expands, Wallerstein points is, is the more you get in the bourgeois who are supposed to be deciding who, um, who owns things and how their policing force controls those buildings. Um, just on an aside, if you just look like um, what the most powerful lobbies are, real estate, oil, things like that, it's not at all, um, as we're told, the um, Israel lobby. Israel lobby only has a lot of power simply because they have a targeted strategy of going directly to senators and they have one issue, their one issue thing. But the people that spend the most money are basically real estate lobbies and um, a couple of other things. And they create artificially high real estate prices through, just like the beer's diamonds, they could have large amounts of diamonds, but they restrict the supply, right? So they have about probably more, probably something like roughly a third of global property is unoccupied. That sounds very high, but I think it's plausibly accurate because that's how you create high, that's how you create high prices, restricting the supply. But that's not the main, it's not really the main issue here. The main issue here is, um, is it true that, um, one, this election is just a choice between, it's sort of like cosmetic, it's like it's a choice between uh, the Thatcher version with Trump and then with some talk about, um, you know, this post-68 Milton Friedman um, libertarianism, which is, um, it absolutely doesn't exist. And Trump is absolutely against Milton Friedman's policy. Milton Friedman is pro-market, Trump is anti-market, he's for tariffs. Is just the definition of anti-market. Um, as against uh, democratic, um, uh, steel-tight, totalitarian control of the market with the policing force to to control their property, to keep their property um, ordered, and then plus the woke discount, which probably had its zenith i think in the dobbs case in 2015 um and then after that it kind of there was no purpose for it except cosmetic um and it decayed into sort of a brutalist a brutalist architecture out of modernism or something like that it's like there's some experts around they have to say oh now this is what we think is the best thing and then they go point in that direction and then it eventually becomes things that most people aren't that into um, this kind of Hollywood um, uh, Holly, Hollywoodization uh, of the Democratic Party um, but the point is Wallerstein versus Zizek okay so the Wallerstein versus Zizek version is one uh, Wallerstein says there's a collapse is is going to happen because of this there's no longer 
uh, workers to exploit, therefore the sort of Gertian um, infinite factor that capitalism is, that Lombard Street, that capitalism exists for the sake of um, making more and more capital rather than for the sake of um, like mid medieval corporations, which there was a fixed amount of things people needed, like beds and uh, candlesticks and um, uh, uh, everything made in the medieval guilds, uh, furniture and so on, um, statues, um, but that it was a fixed number of things to this, um, maybe you could do it even when you had a fixed number of things because you could just start to increase your profits even without even without innovation you could do that if you paid your workers less or whatever and made larger economies of scale or something but um in any case the main the chief way of um increasing the capital stock from setting up places to get cheap labor which are then presented as opening up markets like the opium markets and the um, Pearl River with the gunboats going in and things like that uh, or all over the uh, colonies in Africa and so on setting up places where you can pay workers nothing um, or, or very little compared to what you can pay them in the, um, the wealthy countries so I mean I think what Trump calls the shithole countries is really it's much harsher if you say it straight out. It's really low-income countries. That's what they're really talking about, low-income countries. So once you've exploited the pe desperate people in low-income countries sufficiently that there's not large numbers of them to um, make your production cheaper anymore, then this is where Wallerstein sees the crisis. And then that plus those people, it's not just that you can no longer do that, but it's also you've created these rivals uh, for control of the bourgeois totalitarian uh, system uh, for their the thing that they own and they have their um, fleece for it. Um, but Zizek thinks, and I think it's quite reasonable alternative case, is that this will simply um, uh, it's like the um, tapered edge. It, it will just keep tapering and then there'll be kind of a um, asymptotic um, slowdown. Sleepiness will set in and molasses, etc. And um, he likes to point to this loader duck thing about the uh, Singapore and so on. But um, I think it has a more totalized um, kind of Heraclitean type of sense of like one falls asleep and then one can no longer see anything except these uh, you know the narrow uh, spelunking and that's the, the, the drips of the water that um, you're trying to get through uh, to an opening in the cave but you don't see um, you don't see what the right questions are and so then you can't get the right answers and the right questions lie more I think outside the political sphere entirely for the reasons that I just said and they lie within something that takes a planetary vision so that the uh, it's as though um, there's not a clear, obvious attempt to sort of inocul inoculate the, the political sphere exactly. There, maybe there is. Maybe the Democratic Party is the attempt to inoculate the political sphere, at least in America, from the fear of talking about planetary politics. Because they talk about it openly, where then, then being always uh, behind, being always backwards, the Republican Party then comes out and it, I mean, in the sense that, like, for instance, traditionally Catholics were, they said the time of the quickening was the time you could do abortion up to. But then you get this rump movement where since 
the progressives push the time and say you could do it anytime, even much later, even after birth, um, then you get this this um, uh, uh, so-called reactionary movement with the terminology. It's the French Revolution that says, oh no, you can't have um, abortion at all. So uh, the same thing is like, sort of like, um, they start talking about globalization, and they say so globalization is already fait accompli, and then um, the Republicans start saying, oh no, it's so we have will, free will, we can say no to this, um, we can put a stop to this, and then not only that, we can uh, do tariffs again, we can go back to mercantilism. Oh, not only that, we can go, we could go back in time in any way, because we could, so it's a choice. So, um, uh, that's to me that's the cave talk and I think the um, it's wrapped up in this effeminate um, Trumpian sort of uh, brute it's all like a brutish um, oh we know about um, what the real world is like uh, about business about, about brutish things and it's it's completely there's no um, decomposition of the real situation there's no rigorous thinking there's no analysis there's no um, attempt to see the situation from um, a full scale that being said um, I think a Wallerstein Gijic type of analysis in this sense um, uh, pale by comparison to the um, yeah Kantian or Heideggerian type of analysis but um, that for another time